Today I want to talk about Annihilator and how I beat Insane Roguelike difficulty with it. In the first part of the video I'll go over all of Annihilator's talents and in the second part I'll show you the character that I beat the game with and go more in depth about leveling, prodigies, gear and so on. Annihilator is a difficult to unlock class from the Embers of Rage DLC. It wields a steam gun and a shield, but it's sort of a hybrid class, borrowing elements from Summoner in the form of a lot of temporary summons, and also Alchemist in the form of a permanent summon, while also having a wide range of incredibly powerful both ranged and even melee weapon attacks, giving you a ton of options for how to approach every combat encounter. It uses steam as its resource, which has no fatigue penalties, but does not regenerate out of combat, so all the Tinker classes have to sacrifice some of their inscription slots for steam generators. Let's begin by talking about the heavy weapons category, as it does a good job of introducing the three primary damage types of Annihilator. Lightning, Fire and Acid. When you first take this talent, you will get three new buttons to press, allowing you to equip a flamethrower, shock staff or a bolt gun. These are all very different from each other, but they all use and share five heavy ammo, so while you can cycle between them, it will not reload them. Every talent in this category augments each weapon in different ways, so to make it easier, let's focus on one at a time. Flamethrower does fire damage on hit and over three turns in a cone, that is the size of your steam gun range, and even though it says it only does damage up to range 5, that's not true. It also ignores armor and can never miss, but as you'll find out very quickly, there is some tomfoolery going on in this description, as it can absolutely miss, so I'm not sure if this is a bug or intended, but it seems like it's been in the game for a while. Another weird part about Flamethrower is that sometimes it just stops interacting with enemies. I don't mean it misses, because that tells you in the lock, it just completely ignores them. If this has some logical explanation, I would love to hear it, because I couldn't figure out what's causing it. It only happened a couple of times during my run, so it doesn't have much of an impact, it's just bizarre. Heavy weapon expertise gives Flamethrower a firewall, dealing solid damage and reducing fire resistance, so this is a great opener. Only you can't really open with this, because you first need a heavy weapon equipped to use this talent, and you can only equip a heavy weapon by attacking an enemy, so at best this is the second action in combat. But still good. Automated defense augments your block when you have a heavy weapon equipped. Keep in mind, blocking on Annihilator sort of sucks, because no talents other than the block button let you block, and you don't get repost, so you won't be reliably applying counter strikes. Flamethrower will let you do shield damage and silence everything around you on block, which is extremely useful at shutting down spellcasters. Safety override removes all of your remaining heavy ammunition to trigger a powerful ability. In Flamethrower's case, it's better face door, as it not only teleports you, but also does good damage to surrounding enemies. Annihilator does not have a lot of mobility, so this is incredibly valuable, and by far the biggest reason why I like Flamethrower the most. As with the previous talent, you have to have the Flamethrower equipped before you can use Safety Override, which takes a turn, so even if you don't want to use the Flamethrower, it's good to get an attack in somewhere and just have Safety Override ready to save you. And if you do actively use Flamethrower, I recommend basically always using this before you run out of ammo, even if you are not in imminent danger, because creating more distance always benefits Annihilator with so many summons that you can put in the way. Shockstaff does lightning damage, and it's a melee weapon. It has some powerful bonuses baked into it, reducing enemy damage and automatically attacking with a shield, and it will even automatically dash towards your target, which is crazy mobility. I can hear the berserkers salivating, but the problem is Annihilator has similarly good talents that are ranged, and staying at range is generally way less dangerous than going into melee. It does have powerful abilities though, it gets a really solid AoE stun, 
It does damage and gives you a shield based on the damage when you block. And the safety override is a massive knockback, stunning enemies for 5 turns if they collide with terrain. This is the only access to stun that Annihilator has. And while I think Shockstaff is really cool, and I'm confident you can win on Insane with a full melee Annihilator, I don't think it synergizes super well with the rest of the class. And I mostly see it as a rarely useful option to swap to it for the stun. Bolter does acid damage by firing two projectiles, which will actually generate steam on hit, making this always useful as a filler when you run out of steam. As its first ability, it gets a 5 turn disarm just for the first point, which is super good, completely disabling any weapon using enemies. On block, the Bolter will fire flechettes at enemies, whatever those are, which will then detonate on a hit, doing shield damage. I get the idea of this talent. Bolt gun fires two projectiles, so you can proc these multiple times a turn. But I feel like there are just stronger things to do than this. What might work and make this better, and I didn't think about this until now, is that your turrets might be able to trigger these explosions. That would make this a lot more attractive, but I'm too lazy to go test it out. And the last talent makes the bolter fire a massively damaging beam, even interacting with debuffs a little bit. So the bolter is legit, but it does not have an escape built in. So I found it best at just generating a bit of steam and sometimes for the disarm. Now that we know the general ideas of the different damage types, let's go in order. Magnetism is the lightning tree and it has static shock, which lets you equip shields through cunning and passively augments your block to also give you and some of your minions all resistance for 4 turns. This makes blocking a useful pre-buff, since all resistance is always valuable. Generally on Annihilator, you should stop thinking of block as an ability that blocks damage and just use it for this or the heavy weapon's block effects. Magnetic Field does a big AoE, big hit to enemies around you, with your shield, even destroying projectiles. That's a solid ability, but what I almost like more about this talent is not using it, which slows incoming projectiles, a deceptively good stat to have, basically sort of a shield since it will allow you to step out of the way of damage, and it also reduces enemy crit multiplier. I am gaining confidence in saying this, since no one has corrected me about this yet. Capacitor Discharge passively increases your block value and lets you blow up energy stored from blocking as a chain lightning. A couple points here for the increased block seem reasonable, but recharging this through blocking between every fight is extremely impractical. Sure, the first hit does consistent damage, but it's not very good by itself. But here comes Lightning Web, doing its best to really push this entire block-based package by creating a radius 3 flat damage reduction field for all allies based on your block. Basically this is an AoE psionic shield and if you've seen my videos before you know how much I love those. It's very realistic to get above 150 flat damage reduction late game with this, which is pretty sweet. It even does damage to enemies in the field as a nice bonus and recharges your capacitor discharge, which I'm afraid still doesn't make it good. Demolition has Grenade Launcher, which passively launches a grenade with your first attack each combat, so you basically attack twice. 9 turn cooldown is rough, but for a point I think this is great. Reactive Armor reduces damage from hits over 8% of your max HP by up to 40%. This is a crazy powerful defensive layer that should be maxed on every Annihilator. During my whole run, I honestly thought this affected all damage, but from the way it's written and from a couple forum posts, I guess it actually only affects weapon attacks. But either way, it is still well worth it. Sepper lets you improve the grenade you'll be firing in one of three ways, and I really like both the fire and acid one, slightly leaning towards the slow. What should not be overlooked is that this also makes your turrets explode on death, which does very relevant damage in the early game, 
It for example let me slowly defeat a gunsnake, even though I couldn't hit it because of its defense. Barrage makes you spend a turn to get up to 50% increased attack speed, plus firing random grenades for the next 5 shots. The catch is that you can't use this as a pre-buff, because you first need to fire your regular grenade, and for that you need to target an enemy. And it looks good, right? But there is an unintuitive reason why this talent is a lot less good than it seems. Almost nothing on Annihilator uses attack speed. If you hover over the talents, they all say Steam Tech, so they use Steam Speed. Even the heavy weapon basic attacks, while they fire the grenades, they are also Steam Tech. So I think the only way to use the attack speed is regular Steam Gun shots, which makes this talent a lot less impressive. Gadgets give you Autoloader, which is Weapon Mastery for Steam Guns and Heavy Weapons, so you should max it. This is also what lets you never friendly fire. Exoskeleton is one of my favorite sustains. It's sort of a permanent shield that, first, automatically recharges by 5% each turn, and second, recharges by spending steam. And Annihilator's talents are very expensive. You'll have talents for like 50-60 steam, so this is a very relevant upside. I love it. Hypervision Goggles is track, but better, giving you all resist pen while it's active and passively helping you spot invis enemies. You only really need one point in this, but two points to see a bigger radius are a really big quality of life change. And AED is an active talent that only has an effect if you die or fall below zero life. It then completely negates the lethal blow, healing you while damaging and dazing surrounding enemies. If this was a sustain, or if it was instant speed, it would be absolutely awesome for a class point, but spending a turn on this if you are in danger does not seem productive, as it's not solving the problem. And you could argue that because it lasts 8 turns, you should use it before combat, but then you will have other pre-buffs, which are way more important, because they actually have an effect. So let's say you get into combat with this being up for 4 more turns. Is that good? Perhaps if you play the melee annihilator, but with turrets blocking the way and talents like exoskeleton, you are not dying in the first 4 turns. So I think this talent, at least on insane and lower difficulties, is worth 0 points. Turrets is the tree for the summoner enjoyers. Deploy turret can eventually give you 3 summons, a steam gun turret, which shoots at people, flame turret, which does fire damage, has shorter range and is a lot tankier, and the medic turret, which heals a little bit every turn. The turrets unfortunately can't move, but they last for 10 turns, which more than makes up for that. These kinds of talents are always good in tome, because they let you aggro the enemies, and make them use their most powerful talents while you stay back in complete safety, so even if these were just target dummies with no abilities, they would still be valuable, but the turrets do a lot more than that. And let's also look at the next two talents. Overclock puts a shield on any of these three turrets in sight, that even shoots some lightning at enemies, and upgrade increases their maximum life and gives them new abilities, which basically just let them do the thing they do a little better. And the key here is that these are both instant speed and they make the turrets tankier. In my run, with just a single point in each of these three talents, I had the steam gun turret completely carry me through the early game, because it just buys you so many turrets while doing a lot of damage by itself. And with some investment, once you get flame turret, it can hold its own even late game, but at that point you should never fully rely on them, because sometimes they will just get blown up. Lastly, Hunker Down summons two Guardian Turrets, which you can't overclock, but you can upgrade, and they will redirect a percentage of all damage taken by adjacent allies. In practice, this means you get roughly 2000 extra HP from these, only it's actually better than that, because if they get targeted, they will also tank debuffs, and they even deal a respectable amount of damage themselves. 
Surprisingly, you do not get more turret HP per point, so I think 3 points is the sweet spot for enough damage redirection so that the turrets die before you do. And then you just start with this talent every combat and it should make you feel really safe. It does cost half your steam resource, but it's worth it. In the first locked category, you'll find the permanent summon, the Mecha Arachnid. You can give him two guns, ammo and armor, and he then runs around shooting things. The good news is, since you can equip him with powerful weapons, he's going to deal great damage and have enough accuracy to hit things even in the late game. But the bad news is, he will only have around 40 in all his powers and 0% in the most resistances. So around once you get to the east, you'll begin noticing he dies extremely easily. It does get Storm Coil Generator, which passively reduces damage from big hits and even converts it into global speed. But unfortunately I don't think this helps all that much. A lot of times he dies from random lingering ground effects and if the Rogue Marauder unique does decide to focus him, even this won't save him. You also get Mecha Arachnid Chassis, which lets you specialize the Arachnid into either more of a melee tank or a ranged burst roll. Assault has Overrun, which is Weapon Mastery plus a dash and a taunt active, very powerful. Defensive Protocol gives some evasion, so that it can maybe survive for a bit longer. Pincer Strike is a grapple type effect, letting the Arachnid pin, slow and constantly hit an adjacent enemy. And while this is an extremely powerful effect, the problem is you need to use it on the right enemy. If the Mecha Arachnid just uses it on the first white trash mob that it encounters, it's not going to do much. And automated repair system makes the Arachnid turtle up when it dies, gaining all resist and big life regeneration until it's either fully regenerated or completely destroyed. The ranged version has access to Ghost Cannon, an instant speed beam that ignores armor, then magnetic accelerator, which primarily allows the arachnid to instant speed reposition when it's being attacked, then haywire missiles is an AoE attack that even dazes enemies, and at the end advanced targeting system gives it a chance to trigger an extra attack each shot, as well as physical and lightning penetration, which is crucial for it to do any actual damage. So both of these have very powerful talents, but considering the squishiness problem I mentioned, I think it's unfortunately, at least on insane difficulty, a mistake to overinvest into the Mecha Arachnid. If I had to choose one word for its performance, it would be underwhelming. It is not a bad category, because for the melee version, you can just give it the taunt and the death defiance talent and just let it be annoying, and the ranged version will always get off the Ghost Cannon into a couple extra attacks, and any turn enemies are hitting the Arachnid instead of you is good, but ultimately it's sort of an extra turret that costs you a category point plus 5 to 9 class points. The final talent, Mecha Arachnid Piloting, lets you assume direct control of the Arachnid, making it much more powerful, but it can only move a limited amount of tiles away from you, and leaving my character completely vulnerable really stresses me out. So the only way I see this being good is if it lets you just infinitely send the Arachnid in, have it die, losing all aggro, then you rest, respawn it, send it in again, and repeat. But even if that works, it's not the way that I want to play the game. Artillery is the fire damage tree, and it's one of the most ridiculously powerful talent trees in Tome. Rocket Pot drains 6 steam per turn to launch up to 2 missiles at enemies in sight for a bit over half of your weapon damage as fire. And while that might not seem like that much, the fact that it just keeps going every turn while you are setting up your defensive turrets and shields and it just keeps hitting and hitting and hitting, even triggering on hit effects, it ends up just being really good. And guess what? It gets a lot better from this point. Through incendiary powder, 
which simply gives you more fire damage and also kind of makes enemies die at 25% HP instead of 0 HP, because when they start running around in panic instead of trying to kill you, turns out they are not very dangerous. And if you are facing a particularly nasty enemy, you have lock on to massively increase rocket post damage for your chosen target, instant speed by the way, while even stripping a huge amount of defense from them and disabling any evasion effects so that rogues can never annoy you ever again. And after three amazing talents, you would expect the final one to be something weak or very situational to balance it out, but it turns out death from above might just be the best talent in the game. It fires a shot dealing 268% weapon damage, this is the highest attack damage attack on Annihilator, and it's even a radius to AoE. You can then reactivate this for the next 3 turns, repeating the attack, and during this time you constantly have a late game movement infusion active, alongside a 45% chance to dodge any incoming attacks. And it is for the next 3 turns, not the next 3 attacks, so if you have some global speed you can get off 6, 7, 8 attacks during this time. Now, the downside is you cannot use any other talents, but why would you? This is your best attack, your best escape talent, and really solid damage avoidance all in one package. If you told me to choose only one talent and beat the game with it, I would choose Death From Above, and while I probably wouldn't win, I think I could get pretty far. So the unfortunate reality of Annihilator having 3 damage types as an option is that you start reading through the talents, go, hmm, okay, Shock Staff, cool, Bolter, Flamethrower, really interesting, and then you get to this category and go, oh, okay, I guess I'm going fire. This is one of the very few categories in Tome where you can invest 20 points and feel really good about it. The last tree, Chemical Warfare, is for Acid, and it's the tree that makes AI Annihilators always annoying to deal with, because of Miasma Engine. This is a sustain that will make you create a Radius 3 cloud around you each time you use a non-instant Steam Tech talent, which then debuffs enemies by massively reducing their healing and giving them a stacking chance to fail talents. If they cleanse it, it cannot be reapplied for 9 turns, which is a shame, but if they do not cleanse it, it will basically ruin their life. Caustic Dispersal does great AoE acid damage, while letting you spread the miasma from range, if you are not too keen on getting into melee. Smog Screen is what I like best from this tree, as it lets Miasma stack up on you as well, but it only affects you positively, giving you up to a 24% chance to entirely avoid damage. That's pretty good. It's only a shame that it does not also affect your turrets. And Famigate is the finisher talent for the acid focused builds, consuming all of your Miasma stacks to hit everything in a cone based on your weapon's range for giga damage. The downside is, if you do not kill everything with this, you have to stack up Miasma for smoke screen again, which feels bad, especially when you realize, man, why am I getting punished for using Famigate when I could just be using Death From Above instead? On the generic side, Physics and Chemistry mostly have talents allowing you to craft Tinkers, but Compact Steam Tank is I think the only way to increase your maximum steam and should be maxed as it lets you cast more talents before you have to use a steam generator and steam power gives steam power, which is hard to find otherwise, especially in the regular campaign, so this is also nice to max. Engineering has emergency steam purge, which removes all of your steam to deal fire damage to surrounding enemies, possibly even blinding them if you decide to purge a lot of it. The thing is, you kind of need steam to use your talents, or even to shoot your gun, you generally try to preserve it, not dump it. And while this effect is not bad at all, 
it is not good enough to spend 50 steam on it. Innovation is one of the least impactful talents in Tome. Three stats, saves, armor or defense are good, but you get so very very little for each generic point. Supercharged Tinkers is an instant speed, big boost of steam power and steam tech crit chance, which is very hard to get otherwise, but it costs 60 steam, so if you then cast something like Hunker Down, that's another 50 steam, and suddenly you can't do much else. So it's powerful, but more or less forces you to use a steam generator in the next couple of turns anyways. And the last engineer standing passively gives you cunning, resist to self-inflicted damage, which Annihilator basically can't do anyways, and lowers enemy crit multiplier. Pretty good. You will not be unlocking survival, since you already have track, and the blacksmith tree passively gives some random stats, strength, con, life regen, pin resist, fire and fizz resist, and armor pen and crit multi, nothing special, I don't think this should ever be worth a category point. So here's my guy, straight from the final boss, and this is my friend. As always, these are the items that I use, none of them affect gameplay, it's just for quality of life. I have uploaded the full gameplay without any commentary of High Peak and the final boss, if you are just interested to see how the class plays, and that is linked in the description. And before we get into the character, there is something important that I must mention, which I will forget about very likely, so let's talk about it right away. Once you get into the fortress, usually what you do, right, is you click on this orb, you just spam your buttons, you go through all these options. Oops, I just now opened the far portal, which I didn't do before, so let's deal with that real quick. This can be a nice demonstration of this character. So let's play it real nice and safe, I bait him from around the corner, force him to attack this, we can do a little lock on, and then just spam a... oh, well, we didn't need to spam much, he just died in the first shot. Anyways, uh, the point is that usually, once you talk to this guy, uh, you will start getting energy stored here, and then that lets you unlock this room, where you can test out your abilities, and also lets you configure your of recall, so that it teleports you here. And what gives you this energy is at the end of every zone, when you leave, your transmogrification chest will convert all your items that you don't want into gold, and these items will also give you energy. The problem is, on a Tinker class, by default, you will be using this, the automated portable extractor. And this is very similar, at the end of the zone, it will convert all your unused items into gold, but it then also gives you resources for crafting Tinkers, so for example, steel, and then later Voratun, but unfortunately, that does not give you energy, for whatever reason. And I thought it's bugged for a while, but then I found some random forum post from 2012, uh, where someone said that that's because of this chest. So what you have to do is go to the transmogrification chest and click on use, make it the default item destroyer, and then you go through like a few floors of any dungeon, the energy gets up really quickly and you don't need a lot of it, then you can unlock this room, do your recall, whatever you want, and after that you can go back to your automated portable extractor. That's a really unintuitive, uh, bizarre way that this works, so I felt like I need to mention it. What is the point of this build? I wanted to experience every single part of Annihilator all at the same time. And this is something I often do when I play a class for the first time and I can't decide which way I want to take it, so I did it all at once. I will warn you, uh, this is not the optimal way to build Annihilator, but I think you could argue it's the most fun way to build Annihilator since you get to play with all three of these categories. If you want to do this, you will have to go Kornak, because at the same time, you really, really, really need five inscriptions, since on Tinker classes, you are forced to use steam generators, which take up your inscription slots, so while you can usually get away just with four inscriptions, on Tinker classes, you really want five, so that's why I chose Kornak. The downside is, you will have way too many generic points, and nowhere to put them. 
So if you want to play optimally, you probably don't take Mecha Arachnid and you play something like Shalor, put these points probably into Lightning Web and get all the really, really good Shalor talents. But honestly, Annihilator is such a ridiculously powerful class that you can absolutely get away with this. For the stats, you are looking on Dexterity first and Cunning second, but for a large part of the game, you will be sort of leveling them side by side just because of the stat requirements on your talents and a lot of them require Cunning. But ultimately, Dexterity is a little better since your ammunition will scale 70% Dexterity and 50% Cunning. This one also scales with Magic and that is because of a Prodigy will take and that is the reason why as the third stat you take Magic even though it does not scale with any of your talents. We will be taking Arcane Might as the second Prodigy which gives you a 50% Magic modifier to scale your weapon damage and this is generally just the best way to do it for any weapon class even if it doesn't use magic at all. Arcane Might is just that good. And then the last bits of stat points you can either put into Constitution for a bit of extra life or Strength to get some extra physical power which is always useful on weapon classes since it slightly improves your weapon damage. So the way I used to do these leveling templates is that I would take screenshots of the talents every 10 levels and then I would from memory talk about the way I decided to put the points on those screenshots which made it fairly difficult to follow if you're watching and also pretty difficult for me since I sometimes didn't remember which way I skilled the talents and then I would have to alt tap and look at the screenshots. Don't ask me why I did it that way, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So from now on I'm going to do this part live and I will also put all the screenshots into a Imgr gallery, which will be linked in the description, so that you have all of them in the same place, which would make it a lot easier to follow. Also, if you start as a Kornak Annihilator, maybe for every race, I'm not sure, but as a Kornak, you're going to start with minus one stats. I'm not sure why this is the way it is, but this is normal. If it makes you feel like something is bugged or wrong, uh, I felt the same way but that's just how it is. You start with minus one stat points. You start off with the usual, just putting a single point into all of your talents. Turrets are incredibly powerful early on and they should make the tier one dungeons fairly easy. Uh, the first category point I recommend just putting into an inscription since all of these categories require at least level 10, so there's not really any reason to put them anywhere else. On level 10, you continue investing single points into most of the talents, but focusing on autoloader, which gives you more weapon damage, which scales most of your other talents, and reactive armor, which should make sure that you don't get one shot uh, by some random crits. And with your category point, you can start going into Mecha Arachnid. And I will show how exactly I built it and what items I gave it a bit later on. On the generic side, uh, you see I have one extra point that I don't really have anywhere to put. If you do the arena quest, you will actually have three generic points. And uh, you should get comfortable with this, because this will happen a lot, where you just don't have any reason to really invest your points. In terms of the tinker categories, you don't really ever need to invest into any of them until you are ready to craft something. So for example, if you wanted iron grip, and then you see that it requires, you know, two mechanical, then you would go and put a point into mechanical. But until that point, there's really no need to do that. You don't really need points in light armor training because fatigue is not a factor, because it doesn't affect steam, and you don't really care about defense or armor hardiness since you shouldn't be getting hit too much. That's the main layer of defense, you're just keeping enemies away from you. And obviously you could pump the accuracy, uh, which you will eventually do, but I like saving a couple of these points so that you can invest into compact steam tank, and Steam Power and Last Engineer Standing, as these are the generic talents that at least have some sort of effect. And obviously, as soon as you get Constitution Gear, you should be investing into Six Skin. By level 20, you should have a point in all of the base talents that you are going to use, maxing out Reactive Armor and putting an extra point into Exoskeleton, just for that bit of extra defense. 
and the rest of the points you can pump into your mecha arachnid so that he can enjoy his early to mid game glory before he starts getting one shot in the late game. You also notice that at this point I have cheated my stats a little bit so that I can for example put a point into six skin. In the actual game you will need to save gear that gives you constitution, put it on, put a point into six skin, then take that gear off and you will keep six skin. And with the generics I should just invest into these talents and try to max them. The steam power is likely the best, but you might not have 44 cunning to max it immediately. So this is a more realistic spread. And also I don't exactly remember about the tinkers. Uh, if you need a couple more points in any of these, then you should obviously put it there. In a later segment, I will talk specifically about which tinkers I chose for every part of my gear. And then you have this extra category point where you have a choice you can either put it into inscription or you can start going into artillery. Now that's what I did, but the problem is this costs 6 steam every single turn. And unless you get lucky and find a really good steam generator, you probably won't be able to sustain rocket pot and exoskeleton at the same time. That's 9 steam per turn, which is a lot for level 20. You could obviously run 2 steam generators, but then you only have two inscriptions which could kill you just because you won't have enough debuff cleanses or escapes if you decide to sacrifice a movement infusion. So you don't really have to rush into this. Uh, the real reason why you want to go into artillery rather than the inscription is getting to death from above as fast as possible. But since you need to be at least level 22 for this, you're not really in that much of a rush to put points here. I mean, look, it's optimal to just not take points into Mecha Arachnid and to just rush this, but since we already took this category, we might as well make use of it. By level 30, you should have your Mecha Arachnid fully operational with this late game setup with 5-1-3. You should have 5 points in death from above and fully enjoying its ridiculous capabilities. You probably should have Rocket Pot sustained and constantly running, this will do a lot, even with just a single point in these. And then you will have these three extra points that you can either put into the turret and get access to the flame turret. But even at level 30, if I put down the steam gun and then overclocked it and upgraded it, it was capable of tanking for a little bit, giving me enough time to kill it with the from above and the mecha arachnid. So I instead prioritized defense, putting three points into hunker down, so that it actually redirects a considerable amount of damage, so that it's worth putting down. And then I really like putting 3 points into safety override, so that you get your flamethrower ability to 8 range, which is the escape ability. So just really going heavy on defense, because that's really all you have to do is survive. You have automatic damage through mecha arachnid, through rocket pot, so as long as you live, you are going to win every fight. With the generics, you max out these three at the end, you probably have around three points in six skin, and any extra generic points will be invested somewhere here, depending on which schematics you find. By level 40, you should slowly be working on your artillery tree, getting these talents to five out of five points. The other changes are getting safety override to the eight range, as I mentioned. I like putting one point into heavy weapon expertise, because it increases the fire resistance reduction on the flamethrower by 9%, which is pretty decent. Then you finally unlock the flame turret, which is tankier than the steam gun, so if you're using it for that purpose, it's pretty good. And a point in overclock and upgrade also just serve to help keep it alive. On the generics, ideally you should have your six skin maxed out at this point, maybe on the lower difficulties since you find less gear, uh, this might be more difficult to find gear that increases your constitution. You might as well max out combat accuracy since you will have nowhere else to put the points. And these last five points will probably be spread out somewhere in the tinker categories, again depending on which schematics you find. The category point from level 34 should be put into inscriptions. And then by level 50, after you get Vermbile, you put it into chemical warfare. You rush 5 points into smog screen so that you get that sweet 24% chance to entirely avoid any incoming damage while also giving enemies 28% chance to fail using their talents. Max out all your artillery 
And then the last few points you can sprinkle into deploy turret so that you also get the medic turret, which is okay. Mostly it just gives you another thing to put in front of enemies. Then I also ended up maxing exoskeleton for some extra defense and an extra point into upgrade to make the turrets a little tankier in the late game. On the generic side, this is without the elixir that gives you two extra generic points. I didn't take that because I didn't need it. You will still have enough to max out supercharged tinkers, which is good if you can find the steam cost to use it. Uh, 60 is pretty much half of your steam, makes it very difficult. Basically, it forces you to use your steam generator. So even though it is instant speed, you will need to spend that turn that you save here at some point. And it also depends if you run two steam generators or just a single one, and then you just spread out the rest of your points anywhere you can. Uh, you'll even have enough to put points into innovation, which is really miserable. Uh, this just gives me, maybe you can see if I put one point away and I save the changes. Did it actually change anything? It should, I have some stats, um, stats that are by masters, but maybe I don't, I guess. Or these three percentages don't actually change anything. Oh, I lost one constitution. So <laughs> you see that uh, this talent is really very, very close to completely useless, but the rest of these talents are actually completely useless. You don't need any of this. You get like defense or armor hardiness if you look. Uh, okay, I have 77 defense which is in that kind of sweet spot where you dodge the attacks of enemies that have absolutely zero accuracy boosts, but at the same time, anything that has any amount of accuracy will still hit you, so it's not much point in getting it higher. And the armor, and you know what, it's probably better to just not put as many points into innovation and get the armor hardiness here, but it's definitely not a big deal. For the prodigies, it's really interesting because there are a ton of options but ultimately I ended up going with the, from what I've seen, most common setup with Master of Disasters on level 25. This is good for many reasons. First, you get a lot of value out of it since you use physical power. Eventually you will use spell power through arcane might or convert it into physical power. And then it gives you steam power and steam power is very difficult to get since none of the stats give steam power. You cannot find steam power on items unless it's specific uniques from the Embers of Rage expansion, so that makes it a little too good to pass up. You also then get to apply the cross tier effects, which are effects you get when your power is a tier higher than the enemy's safe, and here the most impactful one is Spell Shocked, for which you need to have a really high spell power. Um, my spell power is actually not that bad, it's 91. So I am able to spell shock enemies. You can see this is the effect of Master of Disasters. All of your powers will be pretty decent. And spell shock gives a 20% reduction to all resistances. The other options you have. So I tested out Blighted Summoning because this gives Bone Shield to all of your summons. And this does work on turrets. It does work on the Mecha Arachnid. So it's pretty funny. Unfortunately, it's only Bone Shield 3, so I think it gives like 2 or 3 charges. That's not great. So unfortunately this does not seem like a real option. I seriously considered Meteoric Crash. Even though this has a willpower requirement, you, I could just get gear to give me 50 willpower and then take this. And it gives you the fire damage bonus and resistance pen to your highest other damage bonus and resistance pen, which would be Acid or Lightning, I guess, in theory. And I felt, you know, I, I could double dip that way. But the thing is, fire is just so, so much better than the other elements because of artillery that you don't really have that much of a reason to go into the other damage types. So in the end, I decided to not take this one either. Adept, I briefly thought about just because I could use more class points, but at the same time, it would be brutally overkill on the generic side. And the way I see Adept is that you should look for reasons not to take Adept, if that makes sense. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I'm not sure what exactly I meant. I guess I'm just saying I don't really like Adept, unless it hits some specific thresholds. 
So then ultimately, as the second prodigy, I ended up with Arcane Might, since really no matter which damage type you choose, everything scales off of your weapon damage. But here's the important part about Arcane Might. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go anti-magic. Since I don't have any way to use my generic points, I thought I would go anti-magic. I wouldn't go into fungus, I would just take the base anti-magic tree, and then I would go Arcane Might. And there's some sort of weird behavior. Either you have to take Arcane Might first, and then you go anti-magic, or you go anti-magic and then you take Arcane Might. I don't know, I would have looked it up, but it doesn't matter because the real reason why you should never take Arcane Might and go anti-magic is that what anti-magic does, as in the anti-magic effect, right, it cancels your uh, magical sustains. So something like Premonition that I eventually took, if I used an anti-magic item, I would have like a 10-15% chance to lose this sustain every turn, so it would constantly turn off and it would be annoying, and you also have a chance to fail using spells. But what this debuff, when you hover over it, doesn't say, is that when you are anti-magic, it also halves your spell power, just straight up cuts it in half. And if you take Arcane Might, what it does is also it cuts your physical power in half. So you don't get any bonuses, it just completely ruins your physical power. So that would have been really, really unfortunate to find out at level 42. So for the inscriptions, it's a little complicated. I think it is best to stick to just a single steam generator, but it's really dependent on you finding a good one. And this is very reliant on luck, since as far as I'm aware, there are no shops that sell steam generators in the regular campaign. So in the early game, until Urkis, I ran a movement, a medical injector, a steam generator, and a healing infusion, because I think it's important to have some sort of health gain to stabilize yourself, and unfortunately, the tinker healing, the healing self, is really not good, because it takes an entire turn. All the other ones are instant, this one takes a turn, so it's just pretty much strictly worse than the healing confusion, and it also doesn't cleanse any debuffs. The problem is, once you kill Arrakis and you get the Rune of Dissipation, you will be still stuck on only four inscriptions for a while. I decided to not use it, and you thankfully only have to wait until level 32 or 34, at which point you can add the Rune Dissipation as your fifth inscription. But then at the very end I decided to swap out the healing infusion for another medical injector, and that's because originally I planned on using second skin, which on tier 5 gives you almost full immunities to poison, disease and bleed, and then I had the last bits of immunity on my rank. Now I ultimately decided to instead do crystal plating, so I'm not actually very immune to poison, disease and bleed, but by the late game, you always have some sort of summon in front of you blocking damage. And I thought if I need to heal, I also have the medic turret that can help me out with that. And of course, in the absolute worst case scenario, you do have the healing self to give you some healing, even if it's bad, even if it takes a full turn. I mentioned it in the talent overview, but I will mention it here again, because it's really important. Death from above gets cancelled by any other talent that you use. For example, if I click on the movement infusion, you see that it cancels death from above, and the same goes for a healing infusion. But if I death from above, and then I use one of my um, injectors, so I use fire self, and death from above is still active. So that is another big advantage of these medical injectors. Now let's talk about the tinkers, because I feel like there's a decent amount of options you have on Annihilator. On your belt, there are two options really. You have Alchemist Helper, which just increases your damage. Uh, here, Fire is useful, since that's like 80% of our damage coming from Artillery. And then the Acid Damage is also useful, because Caustic Dispersal, even on a single point, still does a decent amount of damage. And you sometimes use the Bolt Gun as a filler. So I felt like this is the best option. The other option you have is Fungal Web, which heals you when you use a self. So you could say this sort of solves that problem of not having a heal, but I don't think it does really, since you don't use the selves 
at the point you take damage. You use these to remove debuffs for the most part, or you might use the pain suppressor to pump your resistances up, but these all usually happen early in the fight. Uh, sometimes before you take damage, or any amount of big damage, you will get debuffed and need to cleanse, so I don't actually think Fungal Web is all that good. Also there's this Galvanic Retributor, which is the only tinker that you can attach to your shield, but it costs 4 electricity, and I at the end did not have enough points to put into electricity. I know that I've said you will have an infinite amount of generic points, but I just simply forgot that it exists, and honestly it just does not seem worth it to get like some retaliation damage when you get hit. For your body, you have second skin, which gives you some nice life regen and those sweet immunities. You get ablative armor, which gives you crit resistance, but I just couldn't resist these plus 10 stats because you get a lot of value out of it. Dexterity and cunning scale your weapon, cunning scales your prodigy, the master of disasters, strength gives you physical power, constitution gives you health, Magic gives you arcane might bonuses, and sure, willpower is useless, but 5 out of 6 seemed like a pretty good deal. On your cloak, you should always run a grounding strap, which gives you 50% stun resist, and I mean, sure, you could get this stun resist somewhere else, but the other two just give you resists, so usually this will just be your best option. On your boots, I think by far the best one is the kinetic stabilizer, because it gives you 100% stun immunity. This is the silent killer of Tales of Magial, many of your deaths or situations where you almost die will begin by you getting teleported into a room full of enemies, and this just entirely eliminates that. Now, if you don't believe me, uh, go to War Pride and play through War Pride without any teleport immunity, and then play through War Pride with a 100% teleport immunity, and that should give you all the experience you need to really start to appreciate this. For the hands, I like keeping it simple and just getting disarm immunity. As a weapon class, getting disarmed really really sucks, as you can't use any of your talents. Although actually, maybe you can, I don't know, because I have never gotten disarmed on Annihilator, and I never will, because I use this permanently. All the other ones are usually some sort of active ability, and you already have so many good talents on Annihilator that you don't really need any of them. On your head, it is either headlamp, that gives you accuracy and light, or mental stimulator, that gives you 10 cunning, which scales your master of disasters. So if you don't need the accuracy or the light radius, I think mental stimulator is better. That's what I decided to use. And the light radius you can get on your lantern through white light emitter, which should be more than enough. On the quiver, you have multiple options, uh, for just pure damage, the saw shell is really good. I can just craft it and equip it real quick to show you. It does 300% physical weapon damage, and then also some extra physical weapon damage as bleed over 5 turns. And the rest of them usually have some sort of different effects. Corrosive shell reduces armor, explosive shell explodes in a radius as fire damage. But ultimately what I decided for is the hook shell. Because if there's any weakness to Annihilator as a class, you could argue it is mobility, and what the hook shell does is it lets you shoot anywhere, it's a regular shot, and if you hit an enemy, you will be pulled towards it, but if you just shoot at nothing, you will get pulled towards that area, up to 8 tiles at tier 5. So I think this is the best one. I basically never had to use it, but you always want to have more mobility rather than not enough mobility. And then for the weapon, I ran Thunderclap Coating for a long time, just because it's what I found as the schematic very early on, but ultimately in the late game I swapped into this Fire Groove, that does fire damage on a hit and ignites the ground. It's expensive for 4 explosives in your generics, but you will have the points, and it seems on brand with my character mostly doing fire damage. And since we are talking about tinkers, uh, the mecha arachnid is basically one big tinker, so let's talk about him. You can send any gear you craft or find by transferring it to party and sending it to the mecha arachnid, and then you right click him and control him, which will give you access to his entire inventory and his skills. So the way I see the mecha arachnid 
is that its job is to do a lot of damage and then maybe tank a hit or two and then die. So that is how I've decided to build it. You will have enough points to max out advanced targeting system, which will give physical and lightning penetration, which is important for it to do any damage in the late game. And then the last point I just put into Ghost Cannon for it to deal a bit of extra damage and a slightly shorter cooldown. Uh, for the stats I went for Dexterity and Cunning to scale its weapon damage. And then the last few points I think I put into Strength just for some physical power. So for the ammo you should just prioritize the highest damage possible or just effects like this that have its own percentage chance to happen but they don't apply any debuffs because those debuffs will never apply with the small powers. Then on the weapons, I just did my best and I added Shocking Edge on all of them that deals lightning damage. Uh, I did Crystal Plating to give it some extra stats. I will say uh, whenever it gets damaged, it regenerates super, super slowly. I don't know if it's visible here. Yeah, 0.2 life regeneration. And if you are in a zone when there are a lot of enemies and the game slows down a little bit, you can wait for like 30 seconds to, maybe that's exaggerated, but it takes a really long time for the Mecha Arachnid to regenerate. So the other option you have is to give it second skin just for quality of life so that it has some more life regeneration. And for the ammo, I chose the saw shell as it just does a lot of damage. And then the last part that you should change is if you right click up here, you get all these options. I left all this at the default, but you can change the order in which the Mecha Arachnid will cast its talents. And I just did it like this so that it casts Ghost Cannon at the start since it's instant speed. Then it uses its other two talents and ends up just shooting. It doesn't ever self-destruct or use this link. I don't think you even can use that link. And this little jump for movement, it sometimes uses, it feels like it uses it whenever it's necessary. If it needs to create some distance, it will use it. So I would say the Mecha Arachnid is better than the Alchemist's Golem, but worse than the worm that walks from the rising one. But he does have the coolest sprite. Uh, he's, he's massive, right? He sticks out, out of his own tile and he's carrying a gun in his tail. Uh, how can you not love this guy? On your gear, you are focusing on increased fire damage, fire pen. This is your main damage type. Crit multi is not as important since not only can you not scale steam power easily through item modifiers, but you can't scale steam critical chance either. And while weapon attacks have a 94% chance, when you look at these talents, uh, they are steam tech or a steam tech power. So the only other way you have to boost it is through supercharged tinkers. So it's still a good stat, but you don't need to go overboard. And then obviously you should get your defenses nice and pretty like this. That's just beautiful to look at. And then confusion immunity, stun immunity, the sort of baseline. The few steam items I was talking about is something like this steam powered helmet. This one doesn't actually give any steam power, but it has 10% all resist, which is very tempting. But you can also get a all resistance modifier on the light armor helmets. It is not quite as good, but you can get other stats alongside it. This amulet is pretty miserable, but I did not drop a single tier 5 random unique amulet. Uh, out of phase, by the way, I think I said it in the talent overview, but just in case, does not work with this flamethrower jump. It does not trigger your out of phase, so this stat is just wasted. Cloak also does really nothing. You will notice that I have a lot of cunning on gear. Uh, it's something that I try to get since you not only it scales your weapon damage, but you get powers from it and you get crit from it, which is global crit that works on steam tech. So cunning is really nice. Uh, the only steam powered item I ended up using are these steam powered gauntlets, where you can see they specifically say that they give steam crit. Uh, by the way, the flavor text, the more steam the better means that it makes a set if you have all of the steam powered gear on at the same time but that requires steam powered armor which you can only craft but the schematic for it can only be found in the embers of rage campaign so this set cannot be completed in the regular campaign a really defensive belt um eden's guile on my boots this is my way of staying ethical 
if I don't play Shalor, you can just take Eden's Guile and still get a lot of the power of Shalor without everyone judging you. I just really like it on Tinker classes, since you have free immunities on your Tinkers, you don't really feel the absence of having boots with the Undeterred mod that gives you the triple immunity. And these drop pretty much every game. It's a fairly common unique. Psionic Shield, whatever lantern with some extra cunning. This pretty massive rank with 23 dexterity and 11 cunning. If you have a look at my attack, accuracy and damage, and then I take this ring off, it's you can see it having a pretty big impact. And this is also where um, innovation comes in clutch, giving me two extra cunning and three dexterity. Yep. Massive, massive deal. Most as here. The ammo, uh, this is, I think, the highest damage ammo I've ever seen. All three of the modifiers increase the damage. So this is a ludicrous item. Just your average rope of alchemy, giving you a stupid amount of resistances. The shield is a fun item slot to talk about because it is very rare that you are a class that uses a shield, but you absolutely do not care about the block value or the power value, because I never attack with the shield and I never block with the shield, as in I don't block damage. I do sometimes press the block button because it gives me 10% all resistance, but since it's going to turn off because I don't have eternal guard, a block is just not a very good talent. So. You should purely focus on the resistances and the, the stats on it, not its damage or block value. Unless you obviously go for lightning web, at which point the block value becomes relevant again. And on my weapon I got the majority of the resistance penetration and some more accuracy. The full pre-buff combo for my character, once you have a good enough steam generator, is hypervision goggles, Eden's Guile, Psionic Shield, into Hunker Down, into Flamethrower Shot, then if you really want to, you can even use heavy weapon expertise to debuff their fire resistance. Um, and then you also make sure that you've locked on before you cast your death from above and murder everyone around you. For the elixirs, I went for class points and then I skipped generic points because you really don't need them. And instead you should aim for the plus dexterity plus cunning elixir. And then you can also take the plus 5 luck elixir, because luck is sort of like a combination of cunning and dexterity, but just much much weaker. But it does give you like a 1.5 global crit chance, so it's a way to scale your steam crit. From the escorts, since you are not going anti-magic, you can pick up stuff like premonition and chant of fortress. I like this one better than chant of fortitude, just because it gives physical damage resistance. If it gave nothing else, I would still pick it every single time. And then you just go Dexterity or Cunning. Uh, cunning is probably slightly better. And if those are not an option, you take Magic. And that's it for my Annihilator experience. I actually got sort of bored uh, halfway through the run, just because once I got a Death from above, I realized that that's what I'm going to do for the rest of the run. Just do this 50 times and kill anything that I come across. So I, I played pretty recklessly and quickly and I still don't think I was in danger once during the entire run and I have no idea which class I'm going to play next but I do want to make it something simpler at least in terms of itemization because I still want to do a sort of guide about which items I think are good. I've already made that video once but then I scrapped it because I wasn't satisfied with it and it just should be a lot easier now that I use cleaner item descriptions so probably some sort of melee class. So have fun annihilating enemies and thank you for watching.